I'm really deeply honored to speak on this important and prestigious uh, occasion. And I thank Irfan Bhai for inviting me to give this lecture in memory of Dr. Askar Ali Engineer. I'm also delighted that Professor Mustafa has agreed to chair this lecture and I look forward to his comments. <clears throat> like so many others, I'd come to know about Askar Sam long before I met him. We were all struck by his exemplary physical and moral courage in attacking communalism, in defending secularism, but most of all in publicly dissenting from the religious orthodoxy within his own Bora community. After all, he almost lost his life uh, criticizing his own religion. I began to meet him in the late 80s in seminar and conferences. On one such occasion, I had the honor and pleasure of meeting him for three, four consecutive days. We were invited to an international conference at the University of Hull by Professor B. Kuparik. I think the year was 90 or 1991. We stayed at the same hotel in adjacent rooms, had breakfast, lunch, and dinner together, traveled back to London together by train, and therefore had ample time to have long conversations. As we all know, an unintended but welcome intimacy always develops when Indians go abroad for some common purpose. Whenever we met thereafter, though I confess it wasn't that often, I'm proud to say that we met as friends. My argument in the paper uh, that I gave at Hull was built on a distinction between the content of religious beliefs and practices and the form in which they are encased, by which I meant the manner in which these beliefs are held and therefore the way uh, they affect the way we carry our identity. Content-wise, at that time, I believed that secular and religious identities are very different and sometimes even opposed. But form-wise, they can, I argued, be similar, even identical. For beliefs can be held by us dogmatically, as if we are in possession of an exclusive truth unavailable to others, who, being different from us, hold only false beliefs, with whom conversation is useless. Or else they can be held with humility, with an open-mindedness, in the knowledge that no one has grasp of the whole truth. If both secular and religious ident identities are held, or beliefs are held dogmatically, resulting in hardened categorical identities, the conflict between the, between the two is inevitable. But conflicting content need not result in fierce conflicts if religious and secular beliefs are held firmly, yet lightly, open-mindedly, with humility. They can, get, they can then coexist with mutual respect. The two can even come together to fight religious zealots or intolerant secularists. Askar Ali Engineer Saab responded very well to the paper with, and gave me very generous comments. And this made me realize another quality of his, humility. Askar Ali Engineer approached everyone with humility, both those who supported and followed him and those who were opposed to him. There were two other qualities in him that stood out. First, commitment commitment to his particular religious beliefs, to his community. And here I must emphasize the quality of that commitment, for he understood that the more committed one is to the good of one's religion, the more one loves and identifies with one, one's community, the more upsetting it is to find flaws within it, and the greater the imperative to act to remove uh, the blemishes in, in it. Commitment and internal critique often go together. Uh, uh, this was uh, uh, something that I found really very striking in uh, Dr. Engineer. And finally, indefatigability. He worked tirelessly for his own religious community, strived hard to ward off communalism and defend secularism. He was multiply engaged, always involved with social and political issues. And in this, he reminds me of a common friend who passed away recently, Swami Agnivesh. And I take this occasion to pay my personal tributes to him too. Another fearless fighter like, like Askar Sahib, very similar in outlook, although he was uh, Hindu, 
uh, who was virtually martyred for the cause uh, dear to him. So as we remember Asghar Sahib today, we also celebrate these great human qualities, qualities that forever inspire us. Intellectual courage, humility, commitment, and tireless multiple engagement. In short, this is an occasion to remember not only that exemplary person, but to celebrate the admirable human qualities he embodied. Let me now come to my presentation today, and I would begin uh, by placing it in, uh, in, a, in, in, the, in the current uh, uh, intellectual context. Uh, I'm referring to an interesting exchange that has recently taken place in the media between uh, Yogendra Yadav and Pratap Bhanu Mehta. This intellectual encounter between these two fine commentators on Indian politics and society was thoughtful and incisive, but I believed it, it conflated two equally important but separate questions. The first asked for an explanation for why and how secularism has run into deep crisis, and why further it is in even greater danger in the last few years. This is a question about causation, namely, what are the social, economic, and political factors that has brought about the ever deepening crisis of secularism? The answer to this question may begin with causal factors such as the rise of right-wing populism, often taking the form of a virulent majoritarianism or authoritarian nationalism, the shrinking of democratic space, and the blatant disregard for the rule of law. These account for the current grave threat to secularism or what has been described as its defeat. But the answer may go back in time to the prior failure to address rising economic inequalities, thanks to a new rampant capitalism, and further back in time to the global vacuum created by the collapse of the Soviet Union, and even further back to the resurgence of militant religions, particularly radicalized political Islams in the year 1979. This diachronic account explains why this crisis has been growing for some time now. However, there is a second question, which relates to what, for, when, for want of a better term, we might call intellectual factors. Here we ask, what precisely are the reasons behind secularism losing the moral power that it once had to attract Indian people, particularly the Hindu middle class? This presupposes an account of the best possible interpretation of Indian secularism that explains its original appeal, why people found it inspiring, why they identified with it, why they were propelled to defend it when it was under attack. Now, when this vision loses its appeal, this might be due either to a fundamental change in society, in the transformed character of the very persons who earlier embraced it. And I believe something of this kind has happened in India in the last 30 years since 1991, uh, or because a new discursive account of secularism has come into being or has been manufactured that carries little of its original appeal, that has lost the ethical force of the original vision, its attraction. These two questions are related. The answer to, to, to the second question, as Professor Charles Taylor has pointed out in a different context, has an important bearing to the answer to the first, because ideas themselves play an important causal role in explaining changes in important state of affairs. But the issue here is what precise causal weight to give to these uh, intellectual factors. So we have two separate questions and we have to decide uh, what causal weight to give to ideational factors in the overall uh, explanation of the crisis of secularism. Now, in this exchange, both Yogendra and Pratav give the impression that they find their respective accounts to be sufficient for understanding and explaining the crisis of Indian secularism. Pratap assumes that Yogen is trying to answer the first causal question and finds his answer, answer utterly inadequate to explain the ferocity and venom with which Muslims are under attack and secularism so severely endangered. Pratap's assumption is not entirely unjustified because Yogin never clarifies that his focus is on the second question, namely the intellectual question. As an, answer, as an answer to the first question, his account is very dissatisfactory. 
But then Pratap too fails to distinguish the two questions. He does not grasp that really Yogen's focus is on the second. If he had realized this, he wouldn't have seen Yogen's answers have, uh, uh, he would have seen that Yogen's answers have some plausibility. Secularism has lost its appeal among sections of Hindus because secularism did not connect secularism with a language of tradition, particularly Hindu traditions. They did not speak or learn from the language of religion. They often, as Yogen put it, puts, uh, puts it, mocked Hinduism instead of developing a version of it suitable to our times. Now this answer, I think, goes in the right direction uh, as long as you see it as an answer to the second question. It does help us identify precisely what in this normative idea has begun to leave many Indians cold and indifferent to its fate. Indeed, for more than a decade now, I've been doing precisely, precisely that, to try to give not only the best possible interpretation of Indian secularism, that of course I've been doing, as was pointed out for three decades now, but identify what, which changes in it explain its current malaise to locate its conceptual flaws and find a suitable version that might, that might make it attractive again, not perhaps to all Indians, I don't think that's possible, but at least to enough of them to make a critical difference. So here I try to give an, a detailed, a fuller answer to the second question, namely, uh, what is its original appeal and why it has declined and what we can we do uh, to, 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 uh, to, to, uh, to restore it or to, to rework it, to rejuvenate it, refashion it, uh, rehabilitate secularism. I begin my story of Indian secularism, when, Indian secularism when Indians were on the brink of independence, but not before providing a partly fictitious account, and it is a fictitious account of its historical setting. Imagine a world in which different faiths, modes of worship, philosophical outlooks, and social religious practices exist side by side. Deep diversity is accepted as part of the natural landscape. Syrian Christians, Zoroastrians, Jews, Muslims, uh, either Arab traders who came uh, 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 for trade uh, naturally, or, or Turks and Afghans who came initially as conquerors but settled down not to speak of a variety of South Asian faiths, all were at home. To feel and be secure was a basic psychological, psychosocial condition. All groups exhibit basic self-confidence possible only when trust exists between communities. There is no deep anxiety about the other who does not represent an existential threat. That is not to say that there are no deep intellectual agreements, disagreements and conflicts some of which even lead to violent skirmishes, but these do not issue in major wars or religious persecution. Now, I believe that this approximates, and I say uh, uh, only approximates, the social religious world of the, of the Indian subcontinent, more or less still the advent of colonial modernity and constitutes the background condition of civility and coexistence in India. Uh, Indeed, it's not entirely mistaken to say that until then, India had not undergone a full-fledged process of religionization, a process by which loose community of faiths, nourished by the rituals or teachings or one or more traditions, are transformed into bounded, well-demarcated, rivalrous communities to one of which all members of a society belong and thereby have a fixed, well-differentiated, categorical identity. To be sure, a rough crystallization of religious communities may have taken place in the early modern period. But the idea of modern religion was consolidated in Indian culture like never before in the past, only by the last decades of the 19th century. After this, it became possible to count the number of heads belonging to each religion. Religionization was coterminous with the formation of national communities including Hindu and Muslim nations. With this, the background condition of civility and harmony was unsettled. Religious coexistence could now no longer be taken for granted. Doubts about coexistence forced themselves upon the public arena, and religious coexistence became a problematic issue 
to be spoken about and publicly articulated. An explicit invocation and defense of the idea became necessary that all religions must be at peace with one another, coexist with trust and comfort. And if this trust is undermined, if this mutual confidence is, is uh, broken, then it must be restored. It is around this time that, that a project of what came to be called communal harmony, dependent less on the state and more society-led, began to take shape with Gandhi as its principal articulator. Now, despite the entry and growth of a discourse of communal harmony, matters continue to get worse. However, from the late 1920s, sections of Hindu and Muslim elites were sucked into what can be called a majority minority syndrome, a diseased network of neurotic relations so completely poisoned and accompanied by such a vertiginous assortment of negative emotions like envy, mal malice, jealousy, spite, hatred, that animosity between groups circulated freely, adding layer upon layer of grievances and antagonistic claims, games were played with no end in mind except the defeat and humiliation of the other. Ambedkar provides several examples in his book on, uh, on the partition uh, or, or, the, or, or a book on the, 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 the what, I don't remember what it's called, but it's on the formation of Pakistan. Uh, Hindus and Muslims make preparations against each other, he tells us, without abatement, reminding one of a, and I quote, race and armaments between two hostile nations. If the Hindus have the Banaras University, the Muslims must have the Aligarh University. If the Muslims launch the Tablik movement, the Hindus must start a Shuddhu Mushuddi movement, and so on. A section of the Muslim elites had entered, it seemed, a state of paranoia that was only partly grounded in fears of interreligious domination. That is to say, domination by members of one uh, religion, uh, of members of another religion or another religious community. But eventually, uh, this became a very real prospect for those who stayed behind in India after the formation of Pakistan. This was no longer imaginary fear, but a real thing for people who stayed behind. The majority minority syndrome had another consequence. In the 19th century, a number of freedom and equality related or equality centered reform movements had been initiated within Hindus and Muslims. But the syndrome set off by intercommunal rivalry forestalled these reforms, intensifying anti reformist tendencies. Once again, Ambedkar grasped this point well. When people regard each other as a menace, all energies are spent on meeting this menace. I'm quoting here. The exigencies of a common front against one another generates a conspiracy of silence over social evils. Internal dissent and conflict is quashed in favor of the idea that everyone must close ranks or the community would weaken. Closed, uh, quotes closed. In other words, prospects of intra-religious domination, that is domination by members of a religious community of members of their own community had also grown by the time of India's independence. These religious reform movements or social reform movements had been stalled. It was in such a context, replete with continuing inter and intra-religious domination that independent India had to decide the character of the newly instituted state and its relationship with religion. It had clearly two options, either to have a polity that consolidates both forms of inter-religious domination, a patriarchal upper caste dominated Hindu majority and state, or to have a secular state that blocks these tendencies and tries to reduce both these forms of domination. In 1950, when India was declared a republic, it shows the second option with the explicit objective of dealing with both these forms of institutionalized religious domination. In doing so, two distinctive conceptions of political secularism were developed, one Gandhian and the other that I call constitutional Indian secularism. The first took inspiration from Gandhi's social project of communal harmony was believed, and was believed, was believed to be wholly homegrown and was variously called Sarvadharam Sambhava or Pantanir Pekshita. 
while the originality of this project cannot be denied, it has often been touted as the official state-led Indian secularism, competing with and virtually eclipsing constitutional secularism. I have claimed instead that the Gandhian conception is largely subsumed by constitutional secularism, which better articulates our secular vision. While the emphasis given to communal harmony is important, and in certain contexts solely needed, constitutional secularism has a more balanced approach to religious communities. So, as I said, in what follows, I explain what these two conceptions are, trace their trajectories, and in the final section, briefly indicate where the current discourse of Indian secularism stands, why it has fallen in bad times, and why we must do something about it now. Uh, how much time? Have I taken already quite a lot, isn't it? Uh, I would actually maybe skip the Gandhian uh, conception uh, uh, because I don't want to spend too much time on it, uh, um, except uh, uh, except for saying that uh, uh, that. Although Gandhi felt that a large part of the responsibility for maintaining community, communal harmony lies with members of the communities themselves, uh, and communal harmony is a people-dependent notion, one that Gandhi believed was already part of popular Indian consciousness. In India, somehow this idea began to find articulation in public discourse as secularism, uh, and they, it became sort of a dominant idea that the state must show Sarvadharma Sampav, be equally well disposed to all parts, gods or gods, or, or all religions, even all philosophical conceptions of the ultimate good. And as an entity separate from all religion, the state was to ensure trust between religious communities to restore basic confidence if and when it was undermined. Uh, this, of course, happens under conditions when there is a threat of inter-religious domination. So uh, in this conception, secularism refers to a comportment of the state whereby it maintains distance from all religious and philosophical conceptions in order to promote a certain quality of fraternity or sociability among religious communities, perhaps even inter-religious equality. Now, this makes Gandhian secularism distinctive. Unlike modern Western secularisms that separate church and state for the sake of individual freedom and equality, and have place for neither community nor fraternity, the Gandhian conception demands that the state be secular for better relations between members of all religious communities, especially in times when they are estranged. So I must, I must say that I'm uh, I find the uh, uh, I find it uh, very original and uh, uh, and and uh, and this is a, a very attractive idea that Gandhi developed or the, the or the Gandhians developed, uh, but uh, it's different from what I consider to be the the main uh, governing model of uh, Indian secularism, which I call constitutional Indian secularism. Now, constitutional Indian secularism translates Gandhian political secularism, an adversary of inter-religious domination, into the language of rights. It does so by ensuring that religious communities that are smaller in number have rights that protect them from multiple disadvantages. At the same time, it also goes beyond inter-religious issues to incorporate a transformative agenda aimed at reducing intra-religious domination. It is its opposition to both forms of institutionalized religious domination that makes Indian constitutional secularism really distinctive. So what is the relationship between a constitutional state and religion that it wishes to partially transform? And I actually see Indian constitutional, Indian constitution as a, a, as a charter for the reform of Indian religions in a, you know, a, I think other people have also mentioned this, but, I, but I've, I've increasingly come to believe that that is a, a very significant part of, the, of the, uh, the, the vision of the Constitution. Now, 
uh, to answer this question, the relationship between constitutional state and religion, I begin with the distinction between individual ethics of self-fulfillment and social norms of everyday conduct. By the first, I mean a framework for meaningful living and dying, say a full life in this world, swarga, jannat, or heaven in another world, or freedom from recurrent births and deaths, moksha, nirvan, and so on. By, norms of social, by social norms of everyday conduct, I mean rituals and ceremonies of social interaction, but primarily norms governing interpersonal relations, with whom one should or should not interact, who one should or should not marry, with whom one should or should not dine, who is to perform which job in society, and so on. Ethics of self-fulfillment and norms of social conduct may be so tightly connected that they form one single system. Or the connection between them may be so loose that they're seen to constitute two separate systems. Now, uh, in the Abrahamic traditions, as I see it, the connection between ethics and social norms was increasingly forged so tightly that they became part of a single, deeply connected system. And the term religion, I would in quotes, was invented to refer to this whole, to this entire system. The process by which this tight connection is forged is what I call religion. I call religionization. Thus, if a person chose to be, say, a Latin Christian, he instantly became part of this entire system. Adopting a particular set of Christian beliefs on salvation went hand in hand with taking part in specific Christian rituals and ceremonies and entering a web of unequal social relations with non-Christians. It would be wrong and impermissible for a person with Christian beliefs to participate in non-Christian social rituals or even to tolerate pagans. For this reason, a religion-centered social revolution in Europe meant A, breaking the monopoly of Christianity, presenting options other than dominant Christian ideas of self-fulfillment, that is to say, pluralization of ethics in the sense in which I've used the term, B, loosening the connection between ethics and social norms, freeing social norms from Christian ethics, building norms of social equality that transcended social, that transcended religious identities, what I call you know, broadly secularization, and C, fighting a church that blocked secularization and pluralization. By contrast, the connection between ethics and social norms remained very loose in uh, Indian traditions, at least in the past. Because social norms and power hardly ever dictated the choice of ethics, there was greater innovation, and so ethical frameworks proliferated. People could move freely from one framework to another, and sometimes, without any discomfort, participate in several. And yet, precisely because social norms existed independently of ethics, this very ethical flexibility went hand in hand with great rigidity within social norms. This is so because hierarchical and fixed caste relations lay at the core of these norms. Ironically, they even complemented each other. As long as one remained within the caste system and one knew one's place in the caste system, one can choose any ethical framework, any path to self-fulfillment. A person could find fulfillment in a loving relationship with Krishna, in achieving swarga, in liberation from the cycle of rebirth, and at the same time follow common norms governing equal, unequal social relations. A person may quit a disworldly Vedic ethic in order to lead an ascetic Jain life, but all the while continue to belong to the Vaishya caste and therefore remain enmeshed in hierarchical caste relations. And this was true even for those who became Christians and, or Muslims. They chose a modified Abrahamic ethic, but remained firmly entrenched in the caste system. Now, given that the term religion was invented within Latin Christianity to refer to a single system, it was not easily applicable in the subcontinent where ethics and social norms do not cohere into one single whole. Yet such is the force and sway of the term religion that it has been simultaneously used to refer to, to two relatively distinct and independent systems of first ethics and second social norms. 
This has generated many problems and much confusion. I'd like to explain this point by, following, by, by giving you a simple example from the natural sciences and to, to grasp the absurdity of this profound misnaming. The term water refers to a single entity composed of two distinct elements, oxygen and hydrogen. Where the two gases are deeply connected to form a single compound, the term water is appropriate. But we rightly use two distinct terms, hydrogen and oxygen, for each when the two remain disconnected from each other. How utterly erroneous to call them water when they exist separately. Calling distinct system of ethics and social norms in India by the common term religion is equally insane. Then, but then once uh, a term grips the popular imagination, it's difficult to dislodge it. Uh, some scholars have therefore tried to get out of this hole by using religion in two different senses ethical religion on the one hand, and social religion on the other. Now, though not entirely satisfactory, we might accept this for our purposes and say that in India, a profound pluralism of ethical religions exists, yet followers of different ethical religions part participate in much the same caste-ridden social religion. Now, how does this, all this help us to understand the relationship of our constitution to Indian religions? Unlike Europe, where people have to fight for the pluralization of ethics, or they've had to fight uh, from 15th, 16th century onwards for the pluralization of ethics, here we, A, we strive to conserve the immense pluralism of our ethical religions, to act against any attempted religious homogenization or exclusion. The Indian constitution performs this quote-unquote conservative function. B, by preventing a tight connection between social norms and ethical religion, the Indian constitution also ensures that we do not have religion as conceived in exclusionary monotheistic traditions, something as totalizing as Latin Christianity once was, or perhaps Saudi Islam, although I don't know uh, as well about it, or as Saudi Islam now is. And see, finally, its main objective is to destroy what is at the core of India's dominant social religion, its deeply hierarchical caste system and its gender-based hierarchies. So a number of features mark Indian secularism. First, a distinction is drawn between the identity of the state, which is made largely independent of religion, and an, and an important but limited sphere with, where religion is officially recognized and religious freedom is guaranteed. Here are articles 25 to 30. B, the qualification for citizenship where membership in the state is made wholly independent of religious affiliation, but a small number of important rights are mediated by membership in religious communities. So we have some kind of a limited and moderated uh, 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 differentiated citizenship rights in articles 26 to 30. C, the state is required to be equally well or ill disposed to all religions. No religion is supposed to be politically dominant or favored by the state. More interestingly, and this is the fourth point, religion is understood to be a complex, morally ambiguous phenomena. Some aspects of which deserve respect and non-intervention, other aspects that deserve respect requiring positive intervention from the state, that is to say some help, and still others active disrespect and state intervention, namely ban on untouchability, the potential to reform personal laws, and so on. In short, there is no blanket disrespect towards religion, nor an unqualified respect for them, but rather an attitude of critical respect. This is crucial given the virtual impossibility of distinguishing the religious from the social, as B.R. Ambedkar famously observed. Every aspect of religious doctrine or practice cannot be respected. Respect for religion must be accompanied by critique. This attitude of critical respect finds expression in law and public policy in the form of what I've called principal distance. The strict separation of the French and American variety is rejected. Uh, also abandoned is a policy of favoring one religion as uh, still exists in parts of uh, Western Europe, 
or in the Middle East, uh, I, and I think including Israel. Indeed, the state has to constantly decide when to engage or disengage, uh, when to help or hinder religion, and it does so depending entirely on which of these enhances our constitutional commitment to freedom, equality, and fraternity. In some two features distinguish India's constitutional secularism or from other secularisms, A, critical respect for, and B, principal distance from all religions. In India, the state must have critical respect for and principal distance from all religions to undermine inter-religious and intra-religious domination, or alternatively put, for the sake of freedom and equality across and within religions and fraternity among them. And given this complexity, this constitutional secularism cannot be sustained by governments alone, but require collective commitment from an impartial judiciary, a scrupulous media, civil society activists, an alert citizenry, and of course, uh, uh, intellectuals. Now, I, I think uh, I wouldn't go into what really makes it distinctive. Uh, I mean, just to briefly uh, uh, point out that if we had adopted the French model, we would not be able to recognize religion even in the limited sphere that we do. We would not be able to give minority rights, for example, to religious communities. Uh, we would always have, uh, if uh, in the softer version, we would have active disrespect for religion. Uh, freedom of religion would not be uh, as valued as, as citizenship as a dominant identity. And that citizenship has no religious marker. So uh, we do not follow the French model. Our constitutional does not uh, uh, embody the French model in any way. We have uh, limited uh, disrespect, unlike uh, 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 possibly, although this is not always exercised, uh, possibly uh, uh, a great degree of hostility uh, to, uh, to, to uh, at least control religion. Unlike the US, uh, again, uh, where separation is understood as mutual exclusion, I've, uh, I'm talking about the models here, not the actual practice. Uh, I think uh, this is a mistake that is always, uh, I think it's mis this misleading, uh, this, this, uh, there is a misleading presence of this in, in some of my own writings. Uh, this is uh, the, the dominant sort of model, at least for most of us outside the US, is one of wall of separation, where the state can neither help nor hinder religion. Now, if we were to follow this model, the wall of separation model, and there would be no way that we would have banned untouchability. We wouldn't be able to reform personal laws. We wouldn't be able to uh, provide state subsidy to any religious community, and certainly not to uh, not establish rights for religious minorities. Uh, so uh, there is no passive respect by non-interference uh, in India. We, we have, as I said, uh, principal distance and critical respect. And, and likewise for many West European countries. Now, uh, like Western European countries, we too, in our constitution, have a large number of citizenship rights, which are independent of religion, and they are individualistically construed. Uh, but after initial hostility to the church, I mean, and this is a pattern that is followed throughout Western Europe, not only in France, but in other countries as well. After initial hostility to the church, at some later point, most of the states had become friendly to one religion or to one church of a, the religion. Uh, there was an, and this, was, uh, this took a form of active respect, which means the states actually helped or favored them. Uh, in fact, official recognition is given in the form of weak establishments, uh, even now in at least eight Western European countries. Uh, so there is uh, no uh, uh, acknowledgement of deep religious diversity in most of the uh, constitutions of, of Western Europe. And that is not surprising because all these models grew in predominantly single religion societies. I mean, secularism arose there after 
a great deal of, I would say, unethical religious homogenization had already taken place. Uh, religious diversity was not an issue. The main issue was the church of a single religion and how politically meddlesome and socially oppressive it had become. So naturally, secularism was conceived as separation of church and state uh, to safeguard individual rights. But there was no question of safeguarding collective rights or minority rights. So this is, uh, this is what Indian secularism, uh, in my view, is. Uh, and, and it's very important to judge uh, any uh, deviation uh, by, of, of, of secularism from, by these Indian standards, not to judge them by the wall of separation model or the French model, which are very distinct, or from the Western European one, uh, and so on. And so now let me come to the current, current state of uh, the discourse of secularism in India, which is the last part of my, uh, uh, last part of my presentation. Now, I accept that forces have been unleashed more recently that attack the secular ethos of our country in a manner that is more blatant and persistent. But it would be foolish not to admit that wittingly or unwittingly, deliberately or unintentionally, various social and political groups have been chipping away at the secular edifice so that gradually over time, its legitimacy has been eroded. Indeed, uh, my focus is, is on the discourse of secularism led by secularists themselves. Is it, I think that uh, its, its power, its attraction, and its appeal has vanished uh, because we secularists ourselves, I mean, those who defend it, we lost uh, our way somewhere. So uh, I do not mean to suggest for a moment that it is this which has contributed more to the crisis of secularism than all the external factors that I mentioned. I think the external factors have, the, have, the much, have a much greater causal role to play in the undermining of secularism in India. But I, I just simply don't want to focus on that. I want to focus on internal factors uh, these seem to be beyond be, uh, within our control, and we, we can we can somehow uh, reshape uh, secularism because it's it's sort of more in our hands, and 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 restore uh, the moral appeal and power that it has, and that's that's uh, what I'm going to do. So so where where have we gone wrong with the discourse of secularism? Now, as part of this answer, I'll state I'll give uh, I'll state five propositions. My first point relates to something important that is almost completely absent, uh, almost completely absent from a discourse of secularism. That is to say, the religionization of ethics and faith. Now, this process was fast-tracked and consolidated in Europe during and after the wars of religion in 16th, 17th century. But in India, it did not emerge until, I, I mentioned this, until the 19th century. The history of the subcontinent is littered with millions of individuals and groups having taken steps to form multiple ethical religions, some, sometimes with fluid and at, and at other times with more rigid and exclusive attachments, but a full-blooded idea of a bounded community of a tightening system of ethics and social norms seeking exclusive allegiance was, was at best marginal, not center stage. Fuzzy communities, multiple allegiances, fluid and hybrid and composite identities were possibly the norm. The introduction of the idea of full-grown comprehensive religion had, I believe, a dramatic and somewhat disastrous impact on early religious form formation that still persists in India. Yet I believe this process of religionization is to some extent still reversible. Older religious formations are still very much around and have a fairly stable presence. It follows that religionization is still incomplete and therefore unstable. Reversing this religionization of ethics, of faiths and traditions, or perhaps even rituals and philosophies should be one of the primary tasks of the secular project in India. Secular practice has partially recognized this when, for example, in its, in its invocation of Kabir, 
uh, or a, a figure such as Lal Deir in Kashmir, or more recently Sai Baba of Shirdi. But the issue has never found a powerful, a forceful normative formulation. I believe these religious currents must be supported actively uh, by society and by the state. However, since one must acknowledge at least a partial religionization of faiths and philosophical outlooks, constitutional secularism must try to prevent the formation of religions and confront religions as they are or there already. And with this, I move to my second claim. Those who defend secularism have frequently lost sight of the whole point behind a secular state. What secularism is for? Most Indian secularists have frequently defended not the complex, sophisticated Indian constitutional model that simultaneously opposes both forms of institutionalized religious domination, but instead some very limited and partial version of it, or worse, one or the other of the Western variants that have nothing, that have very little to do with Indian. Well, I shouldn't say that, that's a very strong statement, but that, that really are not Indian, uh, they're, they're, they're not Indian uh, variants. They've alternatingly defended a secularism that is anti-religious, alienating the religious by failing to treat them as citizens worthy of equal respect, sometimes put their force behind uh, an a-religious secularism, failing to understand that no modern state can keep itself aloof from religion, especially in places like India, where religion cannot easily be separated from the social and the cultural, and sometimes chosen to support a vulgar form of Gandhian multi-religious secularism, that is a high propensity to tolerate indefensible social religious practices and that cries foul every time the state intervenes in religion. This has got defenders of secularism into a mess. They've allowed the state to intervene in religion when they should not have, to intervene when restraint was desperately needed and frequently continue to respect aspects of religion not worthy of respect. And they've disrespected those facets that deserve respect. An acute understanding of the complex and variegated ways in which inter and intra-religious domination persists in the interstices of Indian society has been elusive and therefore has been challenged, if at all, only half-heartedly. My third proposition, that Indian secularism is not anti-religious, sorry, sorry, in, that Indian secularism is not anti-religious is widely understood but not that it is simultaneously against both forms of institutionalized religious domination. Now, how did this misunderstanding grow? First, these two struggles, the one against inter-religious domination, that is to say a defense of minority rights, opposite to majority and minority communalism, became separated from the other intra-religious domination. So religion-related patriarchy and caste domination fanaticism, bigotry, and extremism, and so on. Then this intra-religious dimension was ejected from the meaning of secularism, and much to the detriment of its overall value, secularism began, began to be identified by proponents and opponents alike exclusively with the defense of minority rights, as a device for the protection of minorities, especially Muslims. This opened the door for viewing secularism First, as a tool to protect the interests of Muslims and Christians, apparently with no relevance to Hindus, and then for twisting it to appear as a pro as pro-Muslim and anti-Hindu. The strength of Indian secularism is advocacy of minority cultural rights. Uh, where is it? Uh, the strength of Indian secularism, its advocacy of minority cultural rights, was easily made to appear as its weakness. And the burden of its defense, rather than be shared by all citizens, fell on the minorities and pro-minority secularists. Now, this is unfair, partly because it puts the entire burden of defending secularism on minorities and on secularists who are sensitive to the rights of minorities. But secularism is needed as much to protect Hindus uh, and others from intra-religious domination, uh, from, the, uh, from their own fanatics, from their own orthodox elements and extremists. 
and from proponents of religion-based caste and gender hierarchies. <coughs> Sorry. Indeed, there are good reasons to believe that a causal nexus exists, and I think this is a very important point in my view, that there are good reasons to believe that a causal nexus exists between a failure to address intra-religious domination, in particular caste hierarchies, and the intensification of inter-religious domination. The more one ducks the problem of caste hierarchies by taking refuge in a discourse of upper caste-led Hindu identity, the more intensified the scapegoating of minorities and Christians, and the deeper the abyss into which secularism falls. I fear far, for, far from challenging this reduction, Indian secularists have frequently accepted it. My fourth proposition <clears throat> has to do with secularism's frequent failure to distinguish communitarianism from communalism. Communitarianism simply notes that an individual is at least partly defined by his or her religious and philosophical commitments by his community and traditions. Therefore, I, I think it's entirely appropriate for someone to claim that he's a Hindu, a Muslim, a Sikh, a Christian, an atheist, and so on. And even to take legitimate pride in one's community or be ashamed of it when there is good reason to. Communalism is different. Here, one's identity and the existence and interests of one's community are viewed, even defined, as necessarily opposed to others. It is communal to believe or act in a way that presupposes that one can't be a Hindu without being anti-Muslim or vice versa. Communalism is communitarianism gone sour. It is to see each other as enemies locked in a permanent war with one another. Every decent Indian national should be against communalism. But no one should decry legitimate forms of communitarianism. I think uh, Oscar Ali engineer exemplified this. It's simply wrong to conflate communitarianism, communitarianism with, with communalism. Now, the conflation of communitarian and communal in India is often meant that secular persons with a Hindu uh, background or a, or a, you know, a, a Hindu uh, lapsed Hindu identity have not found a way of articulating the religious or social religious interests of Hindus without sounding communal and, are, and have often appeared to have defended Muslim faith and interests in bad faith, as if in doing so they were really being communal, but this was permissible given the vulnerability of minorities in a representative democracy dom dominated by Hindus. The fact is that there is nothing wrong in articulating and defending some Hindu, Muslim, and Christian interests, as long as they do not come into conflict with one another. Attention must be drawn to another problem of Indian secularism. Our education system often fails to distinguish religious instruction and religious education. No publicly, no publicly funded school or college should have religious instruction. This is best done at home or in privately funded schools. But reasonable, decent education should include elementary knowledge of all religious traditions. A deeper understanding of these traditions is vital, for it would make young students aware of the strengths and weaknesses of their traditions and discern what in them is worth preserving and what is worth discarding. But Indians come out of our education system without a deeper critical understanding of, of any religious philosophical tradition. As a, as a result, a defense of our own religious traditions or critique of other religious traditions is shallow, it lacks weight, and is frequently mischievous. My far last and final point is equally important, and Professor Ganesh has already referred to it. Uh, in the last 40 years or so, ever since Mrs. Indira Gandhi played the so-called Hindu card in the early 80s, we have developed a secularism that is a travesty of the Russian idea what I call party political secularism, an odd nefarious doctrine practiced by all political parties, including the so-called secular forces. This secularism has dispelled principles from the core idea and replaced them with opportunism. Opportunistic distance from all religious communities is its slogan. It has removed critical from critical respect and reduced the idea of respect to making deals with the loudest, most fanatical, orthodox and aggressive sections of every religious group. Thus, political parties keep off, keep off religion or intervene 
as and when it best suits their party or electoral interests. This has led to the unexpected and cynical unlocking in 1986 of the Babri Masjid stroke Ranj and Mamumi temple site, the orthodoxy appeasing curtailment of women's rights in the law overturning the Shah Bano judgment also in 1986, and the indefensible banning of the satanic verses in 1988, all by the Congress party, and to electoral deals with the likes of Imam Bukhari by all and sundry. It has even made states complicit in communal violence. This is a fertile ground for majority in Hinduism, whose spokespersons can question all the deal-making and opportunism of party political secularists without examining their own equally unethical practices. The word all is replaced by majority, respect only with the majority religion, never criticize it, but recklessly demonize others. And the state is rid of the corrupt practice of opportunistic, opportunistic distance, not by restoring principal distance, but by magically abolishing distancing distance altogether. This is untrammeled majoritarianism, merely masquerading as secularism. Alas, electoral politics has sidelined or corrupted our constitutional secularism, and the rise of Hindutva has made the Gandhian part of constitutional secularism redundant. To be fair, electoral politics frequently breeds opportunism. If one's only aim is to win, to do so by any means is tempting. But it is here that we need the courts, a free press, an alert citizenry, and civil society activists to move in, to show a mirror to these parties and tell them what they can and cannot do. At present, I'm afraid Indian constitutional secularism is swallowed, swallowed up by this party political secularism, with not a little help from the opposition, media, and the judiciary. Moreover, since, since it came to power in 2014, the BJP's majoritarian, asli secularism has done much to undermine the democratic and institutional conditions of constitutional secularism. With the abrogation of the Kashmir-related Article 370, the introduction of the severely discriminatory Citizenship Amendment Act that adds a religious test to the procedure of granting citizenship, the bewildering court judgment on the Ayodhya dispute, and the brazenly, brazenly partisan handling of the recent uh, communal rights in Delhi, constitutional secularism has been forced to go on the ventilator. Indeed, secularism has already been pronounced dead by many. I suggest that this judgment is premature and unsound, but it does not take a long-term view. As I see it, two crucial moves are needed to kickstart the discourse and practice of secularism. <clears throat> First, a shift of focus from a politically-led project to a socially movement, socially driven movement or justice, particularly within religions. Second, a slight shift of emphasis from inter-religious to intra-religious issues. Recall the birth of the majority minority syndrome in the late 1920s. Today, a century later, after the formation of Pakistan and the rise of majoritarianism, Indian Muslims appear to have opted out of this syndrome. When this happens, the syndrome implodes. The result has been neither open conflict nor harmony, simply an exiled exist existence of Muslims in their own homeland. Remember the other debilitating consequence of the syndrome. All dissent within the community is muscled and much needed internal reforms are stalled. If so, the collapse of the syndrome unintentionally throws up an opportunity. As the focus shifts from the other to oneself, it may allow deeper introspection within, multiple dissenting voices to resurface, create conditions to root out intra-religious injustices, and make members of religious communities free and equal. After all, the Indian project of secularism has been thwarted as much by party politics as by religious orthodoxy and dogma. For the moment, the state-driven political project of secularism and its legal constitutional form appear to have taken a hit. But precisely this setback can be turned into an opportunity to revitalize the social project of secularism. Since the, since the Indian state has failed to support victims of oppression sanctioned by religion, a peaceful and democratic secularism from below provides a vantage point from which to carry out 
a much needed internal critique and reform of our own respective religions to enable their compatibility with constitutional values of equality, liberty, and justice. A collective push from young men and women, untainted by the politics and ideological straightjacking of the recent past, may help st strengthen the social struggle of emancipation from intra-religious injustices. Those who most benefit from upholding these constitutional values, the oppressed minorities, Dalits, women, citizens sick to death with zealotry or crass commercialization of their faiths must together renew this project. I'm not suggesting that secularists must hereby ignore inter-religious issues, but having itself produced disharmony is surely beyond the capacity of the current state to restore communal harmony. But distance, freedom from mutual obsession, give communities breathing space. Each can now explore resources within to construct new ways of living together. The issue here is not simple retrieval of older failed modes of religious toleration. The political project of secularism arose precisely because religious toleration no longer worked. Needed today are new forms of socio-religious reciprocity, crucial for the business of everyday life and novel ways of reducing the political alienation of citizens, a democratic deficit whose ramifications go far beyond the ambit of secularism. At last, it's time to conclude. I've argued here that secularists who wish or hope for the resurrection of secularism must accept that somewhere down the road, they lost their way. Many of us have allowed Indian secularism to be conflated with Western models misrecognized the distinctive features of Indian secularism, namely critical respect for and principle distance from all religions. We've also allowed it to be viewed purely as a device for the protection of minorities, rather, to be, rather than be seen equally importantly as fighting caste and gender hierarchies. Many of us fail to recognize that secularism exists as much to fight intra as inter-religious domination and have allowed the link between secularism and the struggle for Dalit emancipation and gender justice to be broken. I've spoken of other internal flaws. Unless we take corrective conceptual measures, the future of secularism will remain uncertain, even if there is improvement in the social, economic, and political conditions conducive to its growth. Unless we act now, we may find that even when the social and political space for secularism opens up, we may not know what exactly to put there. That would be very tragic indeed. Thank you.